Hello and welcome to Nibble Bob. In this second video on Paradise Lost, we will be looking at Milton in context. In the previous video, we have talked about the age in which Milton wrote, the Puritan age, and along with it, some history which you need to remember while studying Paradise Lost. In this video, we are going to look at the life of Milton and how it is intimately connected with the age in which he wrote. We are not going to go into details about uh, all his works and the uh, kind of things he did. What we are going to look at is how his entire life had been a kind of focusing on that one great thing that he was about to achieve and luckily that great thing is something which you have in your syllabus. Milton's connection with his age went beyond the literary connection or artistic connection. It went to the extent of you know, extreme politics. He was politically involved with what was happening all around in his country. Now from our previous discussions, you have understood that Puritanism was the primary reason uh, behind the civil war in England. And after today's discussion, I am sure you will be able to somehow connect John Milton to this movement of Puritanism. You see, John Milton's life can be divided distinctly into three phases. In his early days when he was growing up, he was an extremely studious person and his father made sure that he had all kinds of resources at his disposal and he went to notable institutions of great repute. So that kind of built a groundwork for his actual greatness which evolved over time. Now you can understand that when a person is in connection with such a variety of literature uh, belonging to the classical age, belonging to the renaissance, that when he eventually begins to write himself or will begin to write himself, then he is definitely going to derive from that huge variety of resources. Now Milton was a Puritan person at heart, but at the same time, he was carrying within him this legacy of the Renaissance. What is legacy? Legacy is the greatness of your predecessors, your uh, forefathers, literary forefathers of course, uh, which you carry within you. And no matter how much you try, uh, you can never completely get rid of them. So Milton became this career of the Renaissance concept of human liberation because ultimately Renaissance was all about humanism and homocentricism and we have talked about that earlier too. So there was this classical influence on him at the same time the influence of the immediate uh, preceding age the Renaissance and along with this the other thing that became a very important factor to groom Milton to become what he became uh, was his extensive travels across Europe. And that kind of provided him with this holistic knowledge, uh, not just about the different cultures, the different kinds of literatures which he came across in these places, but also different ways of looking at history, of looking at human experiences. So that kind of expanded his vision a lot. And while traveling, he came into close contact with figures like Galileo uh, and somehow experienced uh, the flourishing of the scientific revolution that was starting. So his education was not just confined to the four walls of his house library or his school or his college, but extended far beyond. Now during this early phase, you know, when he was getting out of his college and he was traveling across European countries, he primarily wrote many poems. And some of the famous ones are uh, the Nativity Ode, 
and he even wrote a mask called Comus. Again, I would advise you to go and watch the video on the age of Milton uh, to get a comprehensive idea of all his works. His works during this first phase uh, can be seen as an you know, experimentation with different kinds of forms, different kinds of genres, as if he was looking for that masterpiece he was planning to write. So this phase, you know, can be seen as a preparatory phase uh, when he was kind of preparing himself for taking that final flight to greatness. But there was an interruption, you know, the phase two of Milton's life, uh, because unlike what we were expecting him to do, you know, actually write something great after that preparatory stage, he actually went into a phase where he completely separated himself from poetry. And this was a conscious political decision on his part. Now, while he was traveling uh, during his first phase, he came to know about this turmoil back home that there's this problem going on back home and he wanted to be an active participator uh, because he wanted to voice against the tyranny of the king uh, that was uh, holding his country captive. So he returned and he eventually got involved in this whole cause in support of Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell. And Cromwell started to depend on John Milton a lot because Milton was a very erudite man. And how did Milton serve Cromwell or his cause? Well, of course, he uh, didn't fight with his uh, guns and swords. A writer's best weapon is his writing. So he actually proved that a pen is mightier than the sword and he wrote pamphlets after pamphlets. So pamphlets are like these propagandist papers you write. You put a certain point of view in front of people and you circulate it widely. Now in those days uh, there was no social media like Facebook or Twitter or Insta and therefore the only way in which you could reach a lot of people uh, was through these pamphlets which were widely read by all. And Milton, he wrote in support of Cromwell on different issues, pamphlet after pamphlets. Cromwell and Milton had a great bond. And even now we see that uh, literary figures, intellectuals, uh, they often are used as political uh, voices. Uh, by political leaders and this is not wrong altogether because uh, being an intellectual also means that you get to raise your voice against what you think is injustice, you get to make a stand in support of something you believe in. The problem becomes uh, acute when uh, well these intellectuals uh, don't actually always stick to their own convictions. But in case of John Milton, he was an extremely uh, honest person so far as his convictions were concerned. He was not faking his uh, support for Cromwell uh, for any material gain. He actually believed in the ideas that Cromwell represented for everybody in England. And we know that eventually Charles I was executed and Cromwell government came to power. And of course, if Milton had been such a supporter of Cromwell, definitely he got some favors uh, from the Puritan regime. He became the spokesman of uh, this government uh, in, in dealing with even uh, foreign countries because Milton knew a lot of languages. So he was given a very prominent position in the government of Cromwell. So he got a lot of political attention, his fame increased, but there was no poetry during this phase. Personally, I believe that, uh, you know, greatest masterpieces in poetry can never be composed when a person is at the height of his fame. Uh, because somehow poetry has this deep connection with suffering, with loss. So when you are so involved in fame and worldly affairs, so busy, so engaged, of course, you will find no time for great poetry. So that is something which happened with John Milton. Something else happened too. 
Now during this phase, Milton's eyesight started to decline. It was incurable and the more he wrote, the worse the situation became. So by the end of the Cromwell government or rather the point where the restoration happened, Milton had gone like almost completely blind. So from that height of fame and glory, he comes down to a point where almost everything is taken away from him. His political power, his ability to read his own words because now he couldn't even see properly and any relevance so far as society is concerned because he was practically in hiding now and his voice was not to be heard by people all around him because now people were enjoying the rule of Charles II, the kind of rule which a Puritan would actually hate to see in front of him. But again, this gave him the kind of push he needed, the kind of hardship, the kind of suffering from which the greatest works of poetry can be created. So this suffering was something he questions, you know, in, in poems like on his blindness, he's asking himself, what, what purpose am I going to serve now? I can't even see a thing. My whole world has turned dark. And then he kind of answers himself that he who stands and waits is also serving a purpose. This is how he feels that he can finally realize the dream of a lifetime, something which he has always wanted to do in his life. And what was happening uh, like in his domestic life? Milton's marriage didn't work out well. He got married early to a person who belonged to a Catholic family and therefore uh, there was a complete lack of communication between uh, the two which eventually led to separation, eventually led to a lot of heartbreak on his part and all through his life relationship with women had never worked for him and at the end of it like he was a lonely man almost deserted by everybody questioning his own actions, questioning his own purpose and that man could look at religion as a source of all his answers. And this questioning of religion, is the book Paradise Lost? What question did he ask in Paradise Lost? The question is how is God justified? Now at a time when your whole idea of revolution has gone wrong because it's not just a restoration that brought about his uh, tragedy you can say or suffering. Uh, right after Cromwell's death when his son became the uh, Lord Protector, perhaps Milton also felt that there is something inherently wrong in this and the way people embraced Charles II, the way people rejected Puritanism that must have felt very personal to him and somehow he could see in front of him that this whole revolution uh, had been for nothing. That this attempt to dethrone the king, the attempt to kill the king and then to establish a different kind of government, a democratic government, maybe that government was not that democratic at all. So he begins to question perhaps himself. He made a decision when he chose Cromwell early in his life. He must have asked himself countless times, was this choice wrong? Because this revolution clearly failed. People clearly didn't want Cromwell or his rule anymore. The Commonwealth had failed. So was this choice wrong? If yes, then was choosing wrong? I mean, a choice can be a wrong choice. But at that point, was it a wrong decision on his part? 
or the fact that he was capable of making a decision is important. So, these questions are questions integral to a mind which is enlightened by the light of the Renaissance because this question is a question which focuses on choice. How much choice do we actually have in life? Because finally, at the end of it, maybe his choice was wrong, maybe he uh, didn't do the right thing back then, but this realization which he is now having couldn't have been possible if he chose something else. So this realization is worth everything, worth every bit of suffering you might have to endure. And then of course, he begins to question why is he suffering so much and then by extension, why do men suffer so much? I mean, why does the whole of humanity uh, get all these curse of mortality and uh, suffering and pain. So, he becomes like a starting point of his inquiry which extends up to the whole of mankind only to realize at the end that this suffering is necessary because this suffering will make you realize will have that you know anagnorisis of your mistake. No amount of literature, no amount of bookish knowledge can teach you what life can what suffering can. Now, how does he bring all of these things into this book? You see, Milton had always wanted to write something on Adam, Eve and their fall from paradise. But he had always planned to write a tragedy. He, he actually had this name in his mind, you know, Adam Unparadised. That would have been his uh, title of drama. He thought that I will write about Adam, his error of judgment. Of course, he made an error of judgment uh, by uh, choosing that path which Eve took. Uh, I will just make it like a normal play, a tragedy and that is all. But later, he realized that in order to write a play, you need to have a more objective outlook. You need to choose these characters and look at them from outside. And he was too deeply invested in this idea of uh, this biblical uh, idea of choice and divine punishment and all that to be able to objectify the whole thing. So, he rather wanted to give us a narrative where he would give his own ideas, he could voice what he actually felt instead of just uh, giving dialogues uh, to characters who will speak their mind. Now, although there are many similarities between you know tragedies and epics, uh, both starting in media res and other characteristics uh, which match, but essentially tragedy is something which you perform. So, it is a mimetic art it's mimesis or imitation of an action. So, you perform it on stage in front of people and epic is a narrative. So, it's a diegetic text or digesis you can say where a point of view is there, a voice is there speaking to you about something which has happened. There can be dramatic passages in epics uh, where you have speeches uh, which are pretty objective at times. but the voice connecting the speeches, describing the characters, that voice belongs to the person who is narrating or writing that epic for you. So, essentially there is this basic difference between tragedies and epics. So, it was a better choice for Milton to opt for the diegetic way of expression rather than the mimetic one. Of course, Milton wrote a play to Samson Agonistus and it is not a very performance friendly play, uh, but it is more like an introspective play, a closet drama kind of a thing, uh, where it is more like a philosophical idea that he wants to put forward. It is more like internalized action that we identify in the uh, book Samson Agonistus. So, he chose this medium of epic poetry 
and since his eyesight had gone completely by now, he started dictating these words, these sentences, which were going to immortalize him forever. And it's such ironic that the beautiful lines which he ended up creating, he himself could not see them. But what creation? Every color he has ever seen in his life, every kind of light he has ever witnessed, every kind of glorious scene, towns, cities, piece of art, everything is like kind of condensed into that greatest masterpiece. I don't know how much strong his memory was, but being deprived of his eyesight, it was such a magnificent feat to actually recreate those beautiful scenes in front of our eyes, especially in the fourth book where we see the description of paradise, description of Eve. That memory is not just memory of a lifetime of John Milton. It's like a memory of the entire classical age, the entire Renaissance. So he was using every faculty that he ever had to create this masterpiece. So when you read this book, when you will start reading, every time you notice the name of any color, every time you notice description of a scenery, just remember that this man talking to you right now, he cannot see them himself anymore. Those are the chunks of memory, not just from the books which he had read, but from the beautiful landscapes of Europe which he had traveled, landscapes of Italy, landscapes of other places, which he paints back in his work. And the struggles of the Englishmen, the fellow English people, which he witnessed during the Civil War. This man is not just one man speaking to you. This man, this book, is like an entire generation reaching out to you, speaking to you. An entire collection of classical literature speaking to you. Renaissance literature speaking to you. Landscapes of Europe speaking to you. Civil War of England speaking to you. Milton demands a kind of attention, a kind of focus, which you don't have to give to Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare makes sure that you pay attention. He will make you feel entertained. Uh, so you will definitely always focus with 100% uh, attention. But when you study Milton, it's, it's natural to feel tired. It's natural to feel overwhelmed by the kind of words that he uses, the kind of expression that he uses. Shakespeare is like this bright, sunny resort where you feel so comfortable and at the same time you feel so, uh, you know, enthusiastic and enlightened and happy. John Milton is like that dark castle with cobwebbed iron gate. You feel scared. You don't want to enter. But trust me, if you do enter, nothing can match what you can find there. Milton doesn't want to entertain you. That's why he, he doesn't provide you with the kind of motivation that you need to study him. And that is why you need to motivate yourself that I'm going to crack this person that I'm going to crack Paradise Lost. I have to understand what he's actually trying to say in these lines. Because there are so many layers in each and every line of Paradise Lost that no matter how many teachers teach you, there will always be something which you can discover on your own, which all your teachers miss. So let's discover this man together. I don't know how much I have actually scared you or made you feel relaxed by this video. But what I want you to understand is that there is hardly any text in this entire like history of literature, at least English literature, hardly any text which is so autobiographical and at the same time 
so very distant from the writer who is writing. This is a book which demands every attention that you give and deserves every moment that you invest. So hop on to this journey with us. I hope I can make things a little bit less scary for you. Thank you all for being here with me. I am Munami Mukherjee. Please subscribe to our channel if you like our videos. Thank you once again. Stay happy. Stay safe. Bye-bye.